Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. On the show today, we have Patricia Cliff. Patricia is a real estate veteran with over 40 years in the industry, closing over $100 million in volume. She was named number 155 on Wall Street Journal's list of top real estate agents in the nation. She's a sought-after speaker and author. Her latest book is The Art of Selling Real Estate. Patricia, thanks for taking the time out today. Thank you for having me. Very interesting to chat with you. Well, I've Hmm. given a a brief background, but take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Well, first of all, I'll tell you, it's $100 million a year that we do, <laughs> basically my two partners and myself, rather than just $100 million. And sometimes it's 85 and sometimes it's 110 but that's the range of the amount of real estate that we, that we initiate every year, uh, transactions. Anyway, my business, I started in 1973, and, you know, it was a very different business then. And at that juncture, in Manhattan, there were less than 1,000 agents selling um, selling real estate, uh, residential real estate, that is. And now they're over 22,000. Wow. So that has, uh, granted that there are, is more product to sell, there's been a lot of development, but not that much more. So you really can't be a casual housewife picking up a little bit of change these days. You have to be very invested in your business, both uh, personally, psychologically, and financially, to make a success of it and rise above you know, the average person selling real estate. What, let me ask you this. <clears throat> You've been in it for 40 years. What did you do before you started your current company? Well, I'm a lawyer by training, but the funny thing is I, I actually went to law school while I, was, while I was selling real estate, and then I discovered that I really liked selling real estate better. But it, it, um, before that, I was living in Europe. I had a friend, and I helped him with real estate development, and I worked on the Olympics uh, in Munich. And then I came back here, and my initiation into the real estate business in New York was to work with Aristotle Onassis on the creation and design of Olympic Tower, which was the first really iconic modern condo building in Manhattan. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the biggest hurdle real estate entrepreneurs have to overcome in creating a successful business? When you say entrepreneurs, you mean agents, Agents, right? yeah. Yeah. I think that one of the most uh, – the biggest, the biggest failures is that there isn't a financial plan in place. And this is not a business that you can just, you know, go from being middle management somewhere where you get a regular paycheck and they take your taxes out and they take your Social Security out and jump into this with both feet and expect that you're going to pay your bills. I mean, you really have to reckon on a minimum – of six months with absolutely no income. And if you're smart, you'll reckon on a year, even if you have to plan meagerly. But the even if you go out the first day and sell something, it's three or four months before you see the money. Right. So financial planning, I think, is key to this business, initially and throughout your career. Because a lot of people, you know, they have a great year and they think, oh, I'm going to go first class to this and that. And, I'm gonna, you know, and then there's a tax man to pay and they don't have any money left. So I think you have to be fiscally very prudent, and before you start in the business, you have to have a plan, of both of what your expenses will be investing in your business, which at very least is your car or taxis or transportation, your cell phone, etc., and some advertising you may have to do, but also how to pay the rent, how to, you know, how to plan to pay your everyday living expenses. And I think people overlook that. They think, oh, this is, especially now with all these shows, oh, this is a glamorous business, you know, and I'm going to jump into it with both feet. And then at noon on Friday, I'm going to jump into my Porsche and go out to the Hamptons, you know. It's not quite like that. You know, speaking of that, that's interesting. You're the first person who ever has brought that up so far. You know, you talk about, you know, planning and budgeting and and spending money on marketing. How does somebody, uh, you know, determine a marketing budget. Let's say you're new. How do you like how did where do you would you go to to figure that out? Well, there are a million ways to market. I mean, it depends upon which 
I, most people are affiliated with a company, and I would certainly say that in today's market, you really have to be affiliated with a reasonably large company because they spend the enormous money on technology and websites and all that. You can't do that as an individual. Um, And usually, depending upon whether you come with any experience, that company will give you an advertising budget. How you spend that is usually up to you. I mean, print advertising is so on its way out that it's a very questionable usage today. The other thing is, I mean, there are very simple things. I go into this in my book. You know, just sold cards, postcards, just just listed cards. These things somehow end up in some lady's file, and five years later they call and say, I know you sold something in my building or my neighborhood, and so forth, and they're very cheap to do. Um, the other thing is developing your own personal website. Now, we don't absolutely have to do that at Corcoran because they have a huge website. But I have done my own website for the book, which is patriciacliff.com. And, it, you know, you spend ten grand on something like that, so it may not be the initial outlay of money that you want to put out there. But, you know, you have to first negotiate with the firm you're working with and see what they will pay for, and then try to really hone your budget to fit that particular amount of money that you have. And then test what works. I mean, different things work in different communities. And, you know, you'd really have to be guided accordingly, but you have to keep good notes about what works and what doesn't work, what brings in business, what doesn't. It's very variable from place to place. It's all about the data. You, it is indeed. I'm going to ask mm-hmm. you a personal question here. I mean, you've had a sure. long career. Was there ever a time when you just felt like it was just too hard and you wanted to quit? And, and how did you push through that roadblock and find success for yourself? Well, I've been a really high earner in this business for a long time. So, yes, there are ups and downs, and nobody who makes a lot of money is doing it at an easy job, you know. So you kind of have to weigh the options. You know, if I were a book editor at Random House, I'd be making a 20th or a 30th of what, I'm, of what I do here. So, you know, sometimes you think, oh, the hell with this. Who needs this? And, but it lasts about five minutes. And what I do then is I go to the movies in the afternoon. <laughs> Uh, that's actually a very good, a very good solution. You know, if if the day has really gone badly, and you've fulfilled all your obligations, and rather than get upset about something, you look and you say, "Oh, I think this uh, the two o'clock movie is the perfect time to go." No lines, you know. And that I do once or twice a year. I think it's very, very therapeutic. Personal time and recharging those batteries is. Yeah, yeah, and ignore. You know, you can really beat down on yourself if, if things go wrong, and things do go wrong. Um, it, rather, than, rather than do that and end up getting depressed and, and then get angry with the next innocent person who calls you, it's better to leave the office, go to a movie, come back refreshed. You know, speaking of getting things wrong, Patricia, yes. what, what do you think the single biggest thing that most realtors get wrong in building their business? Well, I think they underestimate the value and the importance of time allocation and prioritizing. Because this is a business where your success depends upon how you prioritize, which customers you give the most attention to, which deals you give the most attention to, which uh, how focused and also focus, how focused you are on unraveling the issues that you come across that expeditiously because buyers and sellers get very impatient when, you know, all of a sudden the person that they've trusted to do the transaction for them, they find that, you know, it isn't going well. So I think, you know, it's like putting your fingers in a dike. You have to know which one is going to be most useful at the time. And, you know, you only have 24 hours in a day. So I think that the capability of prioritizing is very important. How do you think building a team uh, plays into that? You, there is only 24 hours and there's only one of you. How, how do you think building a team... Uh, I, how, think that, that? I think building a team in today's business is key. Because unless you... And I've seen these people that, you know, are always looking tired and overwhelmed and never take a day off. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't present a pretty picture. So it's better to share the pie and have really good partners or teammates who are there, who are there, you know, one works one weekend, one works one Sunday, one does an open house one evening, so that everybody 
really is participating in the service level that you're delivering to the customer. Well, and I got to tell you, Patricia, the reason why I asked that question is that I read your book, uh, and I mm-hmm. particularly your, chapter ten. You give a ton of actionable advice on how to build a team and how to form a partnership, I, and it was very much detailed. I, I, I want to thank you for that. I really appreciated that chapter. Well, it's interesting on my website. Whenever I write a blog about team building, it, it gets more hits than any other subject. Hmm. So it evidently is something that a lot of people are paying attention to. Tell us about your first breakthrough deal or that that first eureka moment where you're like, this is it. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. When I started in this business, it was a major, major recession that was going on. And right after the Vietnam War, we pulled out of Vietnam, you know, 1973. And I came into this business. I had moved back to New York. A friend said, you'd really be good at this, the way a lot of people got into the business. And I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And... I went to, first I worked with Onassis, and and then after that, because the building wasn't really ready to be marketed at that point, I had a desk at Douglas Elliman, my previous uh, workplace, and, you know, I started selling real real estate retail. You know, people came in, and, you know, I'd go out with them, and, and you put a little ad in the New York Times in those days, and people called you. Anyway, one day the receptionist came in and said, there's a walk in here. Would anybody like to take them? And nobody else wanted. And I said, I'll take anybody. Sure. You know, this nice woman came in. She was in her 60s, widowed, getting married again. And she knew where she wanted to live. It was over on Sutton Place and very specific. And I looked at the little index cards we used in those days. And I said, yeah, well, there are four or five things I can show you. So we made an appointment the next day. I went over. This is my first real retail customer. And she liked one of these, so she said, well, uh, what do I have to pay for this? And I said, um, well, uh, whatever it was, like $80,000, you know, because that was the list price. And she goes, yeah, but do I really have to pay that? I said, yeah, that's the price, you know. And anyway, I sold it to them for $80,000. And I did this like five or six times, and the sales manager called me in and he said, can I ask you something? I said, what? how are you getting full price for all these listings that have been sitting around for six months or a year? I said, isn't that what you're supposed to do? I mean, (laughs) (laughs) how funny. It is very funny. And as a matter of fact, they did a a little piece about me in the times, you know, this is the broker who gets you full price on your listings. And it really jump started my career. He said, yeah, I guess we should all feel that way, the sales manager said, but they've been kicking around so long, you're supposed to negotiate the prices. I said, no, we work for the seller, aren't we supposed to get them the price? So that was how I jump-started my career, by through sheer ignorance and good luck. Wow, wow. Well, you know, did you, let me ask you this, did, did you ever have a super agent or superstar moment where you, you felt like you've arrived? Well, I guess the first time I, <laughs> that's a joke. The first time I sold an apartment or a property over a hundred thousand, and the first time I sold a property over a million. Now that's a number of years ago, because now our average sale is like three to five million. Wow. So you know you can imagine. But those were for me moments when I thought. A hundred thousand dollars. This is like 1974. I'm really in the big league now. <laughs> you know, I'm selling things for six figures. So everything is relative. Um, and you know, we've done some big things for thirty, fifty million dollars. That isn't an every year kind of occasion. But when I look back and think, yeah, I remember that first deal when I broke through the hundred thousand range. It's um, you know, that's what happens when you've been doing things a long time. You can reminisce about that. Yeah, what a great feeling. Yeah. So you know, doing a hundred million dollars, you, mm-hmm. know, you have a lot of you. You, you, you have written uh, two books. You have another one in the works. How do you stay productive and focused on a day-to-day basis? Well, I, you know, I think that is something that you're either born with or you're not. Hmm. Uh, because I meet a lot of agents that are just very scattered. And that's kind of their mentality. Maybe they'll never do superbly well in this business. Or, you know, they kind of move along selling things to their friends and so forth. But there are times that, you know, a lot of these deals are two people deals. The other agent represents the buyer or the seller or whatever. And I I notice that there isn't a really 
linear kind of thought process going on here. And sometimes I'll say to them in a nice way, can I just talk to your client so I can kind of just pull it together a little tighter, you know? I think it, we're all born with minds that function in a certain kind of way. And you were talking earlier about people in the tech business. You know, they all kind of are a little bit kind of in the Asperger's range, you know, yeah. very, very, very focused on certain things. And then there are some of us that are in the middle. You know, we, we're able to prioritize. We're able to focus intensely on what's important and then there are people who are just kind of scattered and they're kind of artistic and friendly and nice and you know it's up to the buyer and the seller which personality trait best suits them and their transaction hmm what, what do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned in your business selling real estate i mean you've done a hundred thousand dollar deals and you've done 50 million dollar deals you know what what is the biggest lesson that you can pull out of your career people are different People, are, People are different. I mean, you know, when you deal with the general public as we do, you realize the enormous difference between personalities, between uh, familial relationships, between the way people interact with each other, interact with their properties. It's sort of fascinating because every day is a new, a new challenge, but you're, the challenge is also kind of getting your mind wrapped around the kind of personality that you're dealing with. Like, you know, if you're dealing with people on Wall Street, you can't really call them before the market closes. Or some people, you know, just have a rhythm to their lives. They go to their yoga class at 7. or the, You know, you have to know when to approach people, when to approach them with good news, with bad news, when you know you can get their ear or their attention. It's a lot of adaptation to a lot of different personality types. And I, I find that challenging and very interesting. Yeah, and I, and I would imagine communication types as well. I mean, you know, the artist is going to communicate differently than the, the different. Wall Street guy. That's right. So is it uh, for you, is that how you, do you choose clients in that way? I mean, w would you uh, prefer working with an artist rather than a short and curt uh, Wall Street guy? And, and do you say no to people? Do you say, no, I, I'm not going to work with you? Well, I have a very good chapter in my book called When to Cut Bait. And it I don't really prefer one personality type over another, provided I have their attention. Um, if you don't have someone's attention and they're not responding to your emails and your phone calls, it's very difficult to engage them in, in a transaction. I can work with any personality type, but I have to be able to feel that there's a partnership here and there's a communication that's going on between us. And what I have found is that there are a number of people, maybe I would say 5% of the people that I've dealt with over the years where it, 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 the chemistry just doesn't work. And, and I put a lot of effort into it before I do this. But there is a way to cut bait and get out of this because if you are in a relationship with somebody and it's frustrating, and they're verbally abusive, and they're non response You've got to cut bait. You've got to get out of that because it's sucking your blood. It's sucking your energy, and you're not going to be able to do other deals. And, you know, you, you go home at night, you feel like kicking the dog and fighting with your <laughs> husband. It's not a good thing to do. And sometimes these are big, heavy hitters. You know, a lot of times sort of hedge fund people that are used to ruling the world – <clears throat> and I won't be treated that way, you know. So there's a point at which I say, okay, I can do this for six weeks or two months. But usually there are also people that don't call you back. And then you have to, without making an enemy of the person, be able to cut bait. And I think that is so important to clear the table of those people because it's such bad karma. And it makes you unhappy. And eventually it will make for a very bad relationship with the person. Yeah, you know, and I'll tell you, that is a skill. That saying no or cutting bait, as you put it, mm -hmm. is a skill mm -hmm. that you have to learn. And sometimes, you know, as a new agent or somebody who wants to get that business, uh, you know, they, they put themselves in situations that, that really it does just suck the energy out of the, the oh, room. Oh, terrible, yeah. terrible. And you don't realize it until you've gotten the guy out of your life or woman. Then suddenly you wake up the next day and it's like a breath of fresh air. You know, you can go on with your life. But, I mean, I give examples and suggestions of how 
how to do this. And if none of them work, because these people aren't used to being rejected, uh, then I give it to a sales manager, you know, and I, you know, I start with, well, you know, my husband and I are going to be going on a long trip. And I think that I would love to refer you to a colleague because you deserve a lot of attention and so forth. Or, you know, we're going to be going college shopping with our son or daughter and, you know, that's going to take a lot of attention. I'll be away. You know, you, you find nice ways to say, I can't, I'm not going to be able to give you the attention you deserve. And then if they're absolutely resistant to that, then you, you have a sales manager kind of intervene. Got it. You know, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and uh, I'm going to ask you something that uh, we didn't go over, over in the pre-interview, um, but I'm curious, especially in Manhattan, how are sites like Zillow and Trulio changing the way a transaction happens? You know, people are going out and they're, they're viewing, they're finding properties kind of on their own. I mean, how does that, how does that change the way, the dynamic between you and a buyer or seller? Well, here's what I think. I think we, we are, well, actually Zillow's now bought Street Easy, but Street Easy was the big, the big um, way that people looked online initially if they didn't go to the individual sites of the companies. And there's also a New York Times.com and so forth and so on. I think that sophisticated people think this is the window shopping point. They don't, you know, look at Zillow and then call 22 brokers to go to see these things individually. I think they, if they're smart, they look, you know, they have an idea they want to live in this district or in, you know, on the Upper East Side or in, and, you know, they'll browse through all these listings and maybe go to some open houses to get an idea of price what their dollar will buy them, what the qualities are of that particular neighborhood, what the drawbacks might be. But then, if you're smart, you want the attention of a really sophisticated, educated agent because they're going to tell you everything that Zillow hasn't told you or that any website hasn't told you. You know, when you put a listing out on, on Corcoran.com, you're obviously going to emphasize the positive things about the listing, you know. And, I mean, I was with actually my sports medicine guy this morning, and he said, do you know that going up York Avenue are going to be thousands of garbage trucks because they're doing the garbage uh, disposal up at the asphalt? I said, yeah, I've known about it for years. They've been fighting it. But, I mean, that is going to affect those properties. Who wants to hear all those garbage trucks in the middle of the night? So, you know, that's nobody's going to put that on the web, you know. And, by the way, you know, the view is great, but you're going to hear the garbage trucks all right. night. So you have to have an agent who's going to, who knows all that stuff, who's going to be able to guide you accordingly to a property that won't lose its value uh, based upon the information available today. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen in five years, but based upon what's in the mar what's going on today, can really advise you about good value, about negotiating, about you know, a lot of these agents have dealt with some of these sellers before and they say it's not a deal to be made there you know this guy's just shopping the market and, you know you really when you're spending this kind of money and I don't care if it's a hundred thousand or 30 million you want somebody who knows that market that you're dealing in that is a great tip you know we're at kind of at the lightning round here and I'm gonna ask you some quick questions sure if you could only recommend one book what would it be and you can't say yours <laughs> no, I wasn't going to say much. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Hmm. And fascinating. Do you have an internet tool like an Evernote that you're in love with? Well, I do use Evernote, but you know what I like is Dropbox. Hmm. And I'll tell you why. Because Dropbox, my partners and my admin and assistant and everything, we put things in Dropbox and we can all instantly access it. They have the key to it. When you go with Evernote, I have my own filing system, and it's, you know, it's more steps. And I think that, you know, important documents should be on Dropbox, and then wherever, wherever John or Jonathan, they can bring it up on their phone, they can see what the terms were of the letter agreement we send someone. I like Dropbox. Perfect. And it's also nice that it's a cloud thing, so nothing gets lost. What are the first three steps a new agent should begin to build his business in the next 10 days? So quick, actionable things that they just jump in and do. Well, I, always, I also say the first thing you should do is get up, get dressed, and get ready to run out the door. A lot of people in this business who work 
partially from home. You know, they get up, they turn on their computer, they make some phone calls, they, and then they look at their watch and they say, oh, yeah, I was going to go to this open house, I was going to go there, and they're still in their pajamas. So I think that one works better and more efficiently when you're dressed to go out the door. That doesn't have to mean in a Chanel suit, but whatever you dress for when you go to business, whether it's uh, casual wear or, or a suit, you have to be ready. By the time 9 o'clock comes, you should be ready to go out the door because you don't know if somebody's going to call you or want you to go, and you can't say, oh, I need 45 minutes. I haven't taken my shower yet, and I just came back from a run. And I... So I think being ready to grab business is really really, really important. And that takes a little bit of training. And I think also, as I said before, budgeting and knowing a couple of months in advance how much money you're prepared to spend on your advertising, on this, on that, being receptive to what works for you, whether it's your country club connections, whether it's your, your husband or wife's business connections and so forth and so on, really hone down on what has brought in business and then try to expand on things that haven't brought in business but that you've seen other brokers doing well uh, zapping business from and give that a little bit of experimental time and then the other thing is just prioritize 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 I love it what do you think you know in terms of a new agent or somebody just trying to be more successful should they look for a mentor? Is that is that something that you recommend or talk well, about? Well, I think yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I've mentored quite a few people because we've we've always had or I've been involved for the past fifteen or twenty years had an assistant, and a lot of them went on to become really good brokers because they you know got to work on big deals, got to meet important people, and they weren't just kind of you know, scrounging around for what normally falls in the lap of, of brand new agents, which are, you know, the, the lower priced things in the less desirable neighborhoods. So I think that if you can work and be mentored by somebody who's really successful, but you have to put a lot of effort into that and you have to be available to that person. So if, you know, you, I mean, the people that I had, oh, well, I'm, can I leave early for the Hamptons? Can I do this? And I'm, you know, there's a whole group of people who are like between 20, and 30 who are always going to these these uh, destination weddings you know oh I got a wedding in Denver I got to go to Seattle I got I said look you know this is not a three-day weekend kind of business you know either you're committed to doing it or you're not so you have to sort of analyze your own life position and say if I'm home with three children this isn't a good thing for me because somebody's going to expect me to be there full time. If I'm not planning on really trying to be trained and make a full time career of it, maybe that isn't what I want to do. I'd have to work too hard. So, you know, you can make money, a decent living working on your own, especially if you have contacts feeding you. But if you really want to do this well, you should be mentored by someone and then you should try and either start a team or become a part of a very successful team. That is great actionable advice. Patricia, give us one piece of parting advice and let us know where we can find you, and we'll sign off. Well, one chapter that I have, which we haven't gone into, is the exit strategy. And I think that's very important for people, you know, my age, let's say, um, who don't necessarily want to schlep around and do the everyday work but want to continue in the business. And I won't give you all the secrets. They can buy the book and find out. But it works very well. And um, if you plan these things a few years in advance, uh, planning is a really important part of of this business, then I think that um, all of these options are open to you. Exit strategy. Now, where can we find you? And uh... you can find me on the Corcoran website, but you can also find me uh, www.patriciacliff.com. That's my personal website and the book website. Well, thank you, Patricia. It's you're certainly an easy person to talk to. I appreciate you taking the time out, and I wish you much success on your new book. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Lovely thanks. talking to you, Toby. Bye bye. Patric- bye bye. Okay, you heard it. That was Patricia Cliff a $100 million a year super agent and author explaining the power of discipline, the value of team building, and finding a mentor. I hope there is one thing you can take away from this episode and implement in your business today. Remember, take action, be passionate, and dream big. Until next time, I'm Toby Salgado, and I personally thank you for listening to Super Agents Live. Let's go!
Yeah.